So why is it, as the Snickers commercial says, why is it that you're not yourself when you're hungry or even when you're tired? Why is it that when you visit your family, maybe you feel like you're trapped as a teenager again, even though the rest of the time you're a fully functioning and even successful adult? Why do you, we sometimes spontaneously act in ways we later forget? And how do all these questions relate to our faith and our spirituality? Well, today we're going to give a short definition of what relational neuroscience is and what's going on. But first of all, this is the Being With podcast on neuroscience, spiritual formation, and faith. And we're brought to you by Grassroots Christianity. So in this podcast, whenever we talk about neuroscience, we're going to be talking specifically about relational neuroscience. So what does that mean? What do I mean by that in this show? Well, it's not just about brain scans or um, MRIs and those types of things, although they're very important. But what I really mean is a field that's now called interpersonal neurobiology. So what does that mean? Dan Siegel in his mammoth book called uh, The Developing Mind, he says this, interpersonal neurobiology embraces everything from our deepest relational connections with one another to the synaptic connections that we have within our extended nervous systems. Okay, so what does that mean? Let's look at the first word, um, neurobiology. It's a combination of neurology and biology. So neurology is the study of the brain as well as the nervous system. And it's really the understanding that our whole brain and our nervous system is connected to our entire bodies. And so that's why we're an embodied brain. And that's why our embodied existence is so important. The second word that it comes from is biology, which is the study of life. How does our brain function to sustain life? Uh, what does it mean? Uh, what does a flourishing life look like? Biology focuses on these things and it looks at the genetic as well as the chemical level of our life. So really briefly, that's what neurobiology is referring to, is our nervous systems and biology and life and things like that. So what about interpersonal? Well, this one is quite expansive. This is how all of our relationships, especially our early relationships, have a fundamental impact on the formation and the function of our brains. So let's fill that out a little bit. Dan Siegel talks about three fundamental assumptions that are part of interpersonal neurobiology or what we're gonna be calling just relational uh, neuroscience. So the first foundational assumption is that our mind is a, a physically embodied and relationally embedded embedded reality. Let me say that again. Our mind is a physically embodied and relationally embedded reality. So our minds are what we think about as our personhood is connected to our bodies and our brains, but it's also connected to all of our relationships. Our mind or our personhood is second, an emergent process that kind of comes out of our individual brain and the corporate relationships that we have. And then lastly, and this is so important, Lastly, experience, this is the last assumption, experience, the things that we experience, fundamentally shape the developing mind. As he says, human connections shape neural connections, but then later our formed and functioning neural connections shape and control our human connections. So there's this kind of feedback loop between our neural connections and our human connections. And that's what interpersonal neurobiology is all about. About, But to understand all those neural connections and those relational connections, we have to look at lots of other fields of study. And so interpersonal neurobiology will look at childhood development. It'll look at evolutionary psychology. It'll look at psychotherapy, fa family systems therapy, and attachment theory, as, long as, as well as anthropology and other fields. So it's really expansive. So when we're talking about the whole human person, being made in the image of God, neuroscience, as we'll be talking about it in this podcast, is this relational neuroscience that encompasses our whole being. So really quick, what is the structure of our brain? Dan Siegel uh, and some others have talked about 
your brain in the palm of your hand. So if you're watching this on YouTube, then you'll see me. But otherwise, if you're just listening, uh, if you're driving or if you're exercising, if you have one hand free, you can just put it up, all your fingers spread out. Now, put your thumb in the palm of your hand and then close your fingers on top of your thumb. So this is the brain in the palm of your hand. Your wrist or the bottom that your fingers aren't covering is your brainstem. This is where the semi-automatic kind of responses occur that regulate uh, the, your internal organs and body functions. You're also, um, this is where your fight, flight, or freeze responses uh, kick in. They hit your brainstem, so that's on the very bottom. If you open up your hands and where your thumb is rolled in, that's your limbic system or your limbic region. This is where your brain kind of really processes your relationships, your emotional regulation, as well as kind of your very deep uh, and earliest memories and internal uh, working models and different things like that. When you put your fingers over your thumb, that's your cortex or your prefrontal cortex would be the knuckles right at the very front. Um, and this is the part of the brain that does uh, creates representations of the world, as well as where you make advanced plans and you kind of understand cause and effect, as well as where your morality and those other things kind of uh, emerge from. So this is a model of the structure or the, um, the functions of your brain. Now, Dad Siegel says that uh, sometimes when you're really stressed out or there's a, a difficult situation going on, you can become emotionally flooded. And what he calls it is flipping your lid, where you're no longer kind of remembering who you are with your prefrontal cortex. You're no longer representing the world very well or other people very well. And maybe you're even forgetting your morality or the ways you would like to do because you're living out of your limbic system and your brainstem. You flipped your lid, and in one sense, you're not an integrated person anymore. You're kind of just running on autopilot, and some of those autopilot programs might be very destructive. We lose the ability to connect and, and attune and to have empathy for other people. We are no longer flexible and integrated in our responses, and we kind of forget who we are. So when we flip our lid, uh, maybe you enter into a really angry command and control kind of situation or when you flip your lid Maybe you withdraw and you flee or you just appease people and things like that So we have different reactions when we flip our lid uh, but the goal of neuroscience and interpersonal neurobiology as well as spiritual formation as we'll come to is learning how to integrate ourselves. How can we? Um, unflip our lid and calm ourselves and be able to connect with other people so that's the brain in the palm of your hand. There'll be links to that in the show notes. But what about our formation? So we were just talking just really briefly about the function uh, of our brains, but what about our formation? Well, the truth is, is that early experiences facilitate the process of tuning and pruning our neural connections so that we can connect to the world. As uh, people say regularly, the neurons that fire together wire together. So we have these neural kind of structures that are formed. But basically in relational neuroscience, it shows that our human connections and experiences are even more important than our genetic kind of codes that we've been given. Our developmental process is uh, triggered by our genes, but it only develops properly when we have relational inputs. And if we don't, uh, if we don't develop these properly, then we're actually uh, have reduced or impaired functioning throughout our lives. And so what does this mean that experience actually changes the structure of our brains? That sounds kind of terrible. Now, of course, these things can be repaired, but just imagine these two scenarios growing up. One, if you're a baby and your parents are not very attuned to you, um, and only give you what you need when you really throw a fit, like when you're really wailing as a baby, when you're really crying uh, or fighting with them or something like that, when you only get what you need because you're th making a huge commotion, then long-term you will be formed to primarily give and receive emotional information. Long-term your functioning ability to process cognitive information will be less You'll be what is oftentimes thought of as a gut person, like you feel the world really strongly in your gut because you're really good at emotional information, but maybe not as good with the cognitive information. Now, on the other hand, if you were a baby 
and your parents ignored you so much that you finally decided, you know, in your little baby brain, that giving and receiving emotional information doesn't really help you survive in the world, then you will begin over the long term to prioritize cognitive information. You'll become a head person and you will actually have a very difficult time understanding and giving your own emotional responses as well as understanding other people's emotional responses to you. So again, these are just uh, examples of how our early childhood experience can actually change our brain functions. And this isn't just a metaphor. This is literally how our brains are structured. Our early experiences can do that. So what I talked about just now is related to attachment theory. And that's something else I'm hoping to do a deep dive sometime in the future. So to finish up, so we're just talking, this is a real brief introduction to relational neuroscience, how our relationships can shape the form and functioning of our brains. But why do we want to learn about this? Why not just pray more? Why not just read the Bible more? Why not just do more of those spiritual things in order to have the breakthroughs or the changes or transformations that we're looking for? Well, the truth is, is that our spiritual growth is oftentimes related to our relational growth or our relational capacities. If we have low relational capacities, then we're going to get stuck and we will stop growing in our spiritual lives. And sometimes our relational growth comes from learning how to connect better with our own brains and our own bodies. It's, there's information that maybe we're not processing, cognitive or emotional information that we're not processing very well. And that's going to hinder or slow down our relationship with other people and with God. And the truth is, is that we are fearfully and wonderfully made by God and that God is seeking to renew our humanity. And that happens through the Holy Spirit's work in us. That happens through salvation in Christ. But that also happens. Our maturity also grows through an understanding of how God has made us. And so that's why we're focusing on neuroscience and connecting it to spiritual formation and connecting it to our faith. And in fact, the next episode uh, with Jim Wilder is going to explore exactly how um, a mature disciple is made and how there's things that God does in us and how there's things that we need to do also to be responsible for our own spiritual growth. So check that out. The next episode should already be loaded up. You don't need to wait uh, next week for that. So in closing, please join the Being With podcast community so that you can always know about future episodes, posts, and other resources that we'll be shooting out. Otherwise, please subscribe and review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts, as well as YouTube. And in the show notes, there's also going to be links to some of the stuff that I talked about with Dan Siegel and other resources. We will talk soon. And thank you so much for joining us.